we are here for the talk Wheel of Fortune, analyzing embedded OS number generators with uh, Jos Wetzels and Ali Abasi. Uh, short introduction, they're both researchers. Um, they work with uh, distributed and embedded systems groups at the University of Twente. Um, Jos Wetzels is hardening systems and a hands-on teacher for offensive security. Um, Ali Abasi comes as a researcher from Ruhr Uni in Bochum. He has a chair at System Security. Um, before that, he was uh, head of Vulnerability Analysis and Penetration Testing Group at the Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, Iran. Um, starting with that, I'll just give over to both of them and we'll have a great talk and questions and answers later. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, all right, <laughs> welcome everybody uh, to our talk, Villa Fortune, analyzing embedded OS random number generators. Uh, so start with Jos, you want to yeah. introduce yourself? So, uh, yeah. I'm Jos Wetzels, as I already was introduced, and I'm a researcher at the Distributed uh, and Embedded System Security Group in Twente. And this is uh, Ali Abbasi. Yeah, I am Ali Abbasi, a PhD student at Distributed and Embedded System Security Group of University of Twente and visiting researcher at Chair of System Security of Loh University Bochum in Germany. So, uh, we we'll start with the introduction to embedded OS random number generator today, and then uh, we overview some embedded challenges. Uh, uh, for generally and for specifically for random number OS random number generators, uh, we will have some case studies which showing these challenges how it's affecting already existing uh, embedded OSs or real time operating systems. And uh, well, this work is actually a ongoing research. It's part of uh, your thesis which I am supervising. And uh, yeah, so so. First of all, MS systems are actually now everywhere, from uh, consumer electronics, uh, uh, medical devices, critical infrastructures, uh, military equipments, or aviation. So actually, you see them everywhere. And uh, beside that, there is a drive for connecting these embedded systems as an internet of things. Uh, while this originally these devices was not designed to be connected to the internet, but well, now there is a gap which vendors have to have to fix. Right, and uh, well, this can cause problems, as you can see, for example, uh, for the random number generators, which we specifically work, uh, you can see there are already problems. For example, millions of embedded devices use the same hard-coded SSH and TLS keys, which made some noises in the media. Uh, so, the OS random number generators. Well, what is randomness? I don't want to talk about the f philosophical talk of randomness here, but uh, well, it's generally in a stream of bit if you cannot predict the uh, next bit with a, pro with a probability of more than 50%, then let's call it random. And another side of it is like entropy, uh, which is very interesting. It's a measurement of information, unpredictability, and how, how, how unpredictable are the information, and usually high entropy means very random or higher randomness. And of course, wh why this, these things are important? Because actually, random, random, random numbers are actually uh, a fundamental part of other uh, security ecosystems we have. So, for example, we use it for cryptography stuff, so for keys, nonces, or exploit mitigations, which maybe you never heard about it, but actually we are using them for exploit mitigations, such as ASLR or um, uh, stack smashing protections. So, randomness is actually critical for other other underlying system which builds up on them. So that's why they're critical. So how we can generate a random number. So physically, like true random number uh, uh, generators are like radioactive, radioactive decays or shot noises. Uh, you can uh, implement it in two ways as external devices such as TPM or HSM or as an integrated device within, for example, Intel Ivy Bridge CPUs or certain smart cards. But there are some downsides for it. For example, they are expensive, or there is some uh, portability issues when the vendor tried to move to the next architecture. So that's why 
because you can't use those expensive hardwares, you are using software-based random number generators. Well, there are like deterministic al algorithms which you stretch seeds into sequence of random looking bits. Uh, but the problem is that not all of these random number generators are designed to be used for security purposes. For example, RAND, which we are going to show, it's, it will be used later by some people. It's not designed for security purposes, but some people use it anyway. Uh, so, because of that, you, we have uh, secure random number generators. And uh, those are usually, they have like three features or properties. Uh, first of all, is that uh, the output must be indistinguishable from the uniform. And uh, they must have forward security, which means that in case the internal, uh, internal state of the, of the system is compromised, still uh, the past outputs must still appear random. And uh, again, for backward security as a feature, which is that if internal state is compromised again, the future output still might, might, must appear, uh, appear random, provided that the receding is with a sufficient or good quality entropy. So, because of that, uh, designing random number generators are not easy. So, because of that, you have, for example, some certain standards for it, uh, like NIST SP890A, uh, which assumes some access to possibly by a source of seed entropy. But the problem is that this standard leaves some hard problems, for example, uh, initial seed entropy or uh, receding control or uh, how, how is the quality of the, the source of the entropy. Is. So, because of that, well, some, but some other people think about it and design something else, like, such as Yaro or Fortana, uh, which are already implemented in some advanced OSs, such as OS X or FreeBSD or iOS. So, uh, the problem here is actually a chicken and egg problem, because, uh, well, to generate random numbers, you need some kind of sort of entropy or randomness, but this randomness is, again, needs another source of randomness. So ideally, you want to use the physical phenomena, in, like, such as like if we consider quantum randomness, is like radioactive decay shot noises, or non-quantum randomness, such as thermal noises, atmospheric noises, and sensor values. Well, this is so, let's say, not always available. So practically now, in the, for example, general purpose computers, you can see that you can use unpredictable system events. One good source is the user, in, the user itself. So keystroke timing, mouse movement, or disk access can be used in general purpose computers as a source of, source of entropy. And uh, therefore, actually, we believe that uh, randomness or like uh, secure randomness should be provided as a system service because it's hard and hard to implement it. And well, of course, people make mistakes later <laughs> if you don't. So, Actually, many OSs actually already provide such secure randomness as a system service. For example, do you have dev uh, uRandom in a, in a, in a Unix-like system or CryptGen uh, random API on Windows? And another important thing is that, again, all of all lots of other security products are built upon them. So, uh, for example, um, OpenSSL, for example, assuming that there is a secure a, a service from operating system, as a random number generators, and again, based on OpenSSL, you have like OpenSSH and OpenVPN too, so it's very, very important. So now I think you'll start yeah. with that. All right, so we've taken a look at, at the general background of uh, random number generators, and now we'll take a look at why it's so difficult to get these right in, uh, in the embedded world. So the common advice when you need random numbers in, in the general purpose world is just use DevU random and draw from there. But it's not as easy in the embedded world because of various design issues which mean that uh, operating system random number generators in the embedded world are often absent uh, or broken, as we'll uh, explore in this talk. So the three main areas of constraints are polyculture, resource constraints, and low entropy environments, which we'll all discuss into detail and how these relate to particular uh, implementation difficulties. So the first of all is uh, that in the embedded world, you have a polyculture of operating systems, whereas in the general purpose world, you got Linux, you got Windows, you got your Mac OS X. In the uh, embedded world, you have various kinds of different uh, operating systems, ranging from high capability microkernels to uh, very small monolithic systems, uh, all with different constraints and different kind of capabilities and catering to different systems. So if you design a general operating system, a random number generator design, it's very hard to have this standardized all across the board because of this, this variety. 
And the same, of course, applies to, uh, to the hardware spectrum because you have a wider range of microcontrollers and microprocessors, all with different capabilities. And it's not uncommon to see older or functionally stripped down versions in uh, newly fielded devices. So if you design a random number generator based on the assumption that you have some source of hardware, a uh, random number generator or physical, uh, physical source of entropy, then this means that your operating system cannot be deployed across a wide range of chips. So that's, that's definitely a major design issue there. And of course, uh, embedded devices are designed to have a small footprint and to be resource efficient. And this translates to various limitations when designing random number generators. So for example, uh, limitations with regards to CPU speed translate to lightweight cryptography uh, requirements, power consumption limitations, especially for battery operated devices, mean you need to have a simple design to have limited uh, entropy polling activity. And memory uh, limitations mean you need a small entropy and internal state in your random number generator in order to uh, implement it in these constrained devices. And of course, there's the issue of uh, the embedded world just generally being, being very boring. There is little activity going on and what activity is going on is usually very predictable. And there is a limitation with regards to, to common entropy sources, like, like Ali discussed in the general purpose world, you often use disk activity timings, uh, keyboard uh, events, mouse events. But in the embedded world, you often have to deal with diskless nodes, you don't have peripherals, uh, you don't have a user, and you don't have hardware random number generators. And even commonly available sources like uh, interrupt request timings are often not that good because they're too periodic. And these conditions are usually worst uh, during boot time because you have predictable boot sequences, there's little activity going on uh, at boot, and some entropy sources you might want to rely on are simply not available yet because they have to be initialized by the system after the boot sequence. Yet non-blocking interfaces to random number generators, such as the DEFU random interface, allow for drawing from the random number generator even when insufficient entropy is actually available in the system. And this results in something called a boot time entropy hole. So this is particularly bad because a lot of embedded devices often generate cryptographic keys on the first system boot. So this means that if you have a system with general low entropy conditions and an initial state uh, predetermined in the factory, combined with these, these low boot time uh, conditions and then generating a key, this results in um, very, uh, very serious cryptographic issues. A common solution you encounter to deal with, with boot time entropy in the uh, general purpose world is using so-called seed files, which is basically a file with collected randomness, which is drawn from by the random number generator, uh, put into the system, and when the, the, the system shuts down, it writes to the file again. But in the embedded world, it's kind of hard to generally deploy the solution, because how are you going to deal with diskless nodes? How are you going to draw your entropy before a file system is mounted, which is often required? And still, this doesn't solve the first boot problem. So uh, some common embedded workarounds you encounter is including an initial seed file in the firmware, and this initial seed file obviously better be unique and unpredictable per firmware image, otherwise it doesn't do you much good. Uh, or using personalization data, such as uh, the MAC address or serial number of, uh, of a router, and using it as seed entropy, which is also a very bad idea, as shown in the resource men mentioned on the bottom or using other dubious sources of entropy, such as uh, clock timings, process IDs, foreign MAC addresses, etc., etc., or simply including hard-coded pre-generated keys, which is also a bad idea as shown in the uh, little black box project. So now that we have an idea of why it's hard to, to, to get embedded uh, operating system random number generators right, we're going to look at a couple of case studies of operating systems fielded in uh, various embedded... The cool uh, part. Yeah, the cool part. <laughs> Uh, various embedded systems and how they get this wrong. So the first system we'll look at is uh, QNX, which is a Unix-like POSIX-compliant real-time operating system, initially released in 1982 and later acquired by, uh, by BlackBerry. It's basically the underlying operating system for BlackBerry OS. Uh, it's used a lot in automotive systems as well, particularly uh, the entertainment systems. Uh, you also encounter it in uh, carrier-grade uh, routers, military radios and some nuclear power plants. And, uh, it provides a custom DevU random implementation, which is always non-blocking, so you don't have this, this blocking, non-blocking distinction you have in most Unix-like systems. 
And it's implemented as a user space process addressed by a kernel resource manager because Keonix is a microkernel. Uh, an interesting thing to note is that the random number generator is always started after boot by a startup script. So that's, that's a thing to keep in mind when designing something for QNX. Um, we reverse engineered the, uh, the implementation of the random number generator and it turned out to be based on Yarrow by Bruce Schneier, John Kelsey and Niels Ferguson. But it turned out to be based on an older um, uh, draft implementation of Yarrow and not the reference Yarrow 160 document which, was, which accompanied the, uh, the paper release. So it only has a single entropy pool and no fast and slow pools. And no block cipher is applied to PRNG output at all. It's directly drawn from the internal state. So, and QNX Yarrow uh, in turn diverges from this older implementation as well by mixing PRNG output back into the entropy pool and having some reseed control divergences, which uh, we'll discuss later on. So, this is the design of uh, QNX Yarrow, which is relatively simple. You have your boot time entropy, you have your runtime entropy, and it's drawn into an entropy pool. And then you have uh, the output function, which draws from the entropy pool and also. Uh, seeds back into the PRNG state. We first tested the randomness quality of, uh, of the device output using the Die Harder and the NIST statistical test suite uh, tools. And it passed both of these test suites, but this only tells us something about the quality of the PRNG output. Uh, the source entropy can still be heavily biased, as we'll see later on. After reverse engineering the, the boot time uh, gathering routines, uh, we found that it draws from four sources only, and these are static and non-configurable. Uh, that's the system time, the clock cycle count, uh, the currently active process IDs, and the currently active device names. And they concatenate this, and they pull it through the SHA-1 hash function, and they, uh, the resulting digest is used to uh, initialize the QNX Yaro initial state. So we decided to, because this sounded kind of dodgy, we decided to evaluate the, the boot time entropy because if this is very biased, it might be feasible for an attacker to replicate the PRNG in, in internal state after a reasonable number of guesses. So our quality measure is the, the min entropy, which basically means how likely you are to guess a particular value on the first try. And 256 bits of uniformly random data have 256 bits of uh, min entropy. We use the NIST entropy source testing tool to evaluate this, uh, this data. We collected 50 boot runs by instrumenting the uh, random number generator and logging the raw data that was collected during boot time. And the average min entropy is 0 0.0276, which isn't good at all because that means it has far less than one bit of min entropy per eight bits of raw data. As you can see in the visualization on the right where the dark spots are low entropy spots with a particularly low entropy spot at the, the bottom left, or the top left, I mean. So we also evaluate, evaluated the cross-boot uh, entropy because even if a system has relatively good entropic quality during a single boot run, if it's consistent among various boot runs, this is also behavior you don't want. And it turned out that apart from uh, having less than stellar uh, single boot entropy gathering, it also had a very consistent and predictable pattern across 50 boot visualizations, as you can see on the right. And you need to consider that these this operating systems like these are deployed in firmware images, so processes always spawn in the same order and there's the same number of processes spawning. So all these process IDs that are fed into the boot time uh, entropy are usually static. And the same goes for the device names. And really the only randomness here comes from the clock time and the clock cycles. And even there, there is less variation than you would want because of the real time nature of the system. So this is what, the, after reverse engineering, the, the runtime entropy collection engine uh, looks like. Uh, on the left, you, you got your high performance clock measurements. Uh, on the top, you have system information, which is basically process IDs, thread IDs, flags, all these kind of uh, process variables, which are fed into the, um, through SHA-1 into the Yarrow input function. And uh, in the bottom left, you have your interrupt uh, timing source. Uh, in the bottom right, there is an undocumented uh, function, which is a callback option to a library, possibly for true random number generator support, but there's nothing in the documentation there. And it's not clear from the code either. So, uh. so some thoughts on this runtime entropy. Um, the system information polling has some problems because there's lots of static information. Things like user ID, flags, and priority are not likely to vary at all between different runs. 
And stack and program base will only vary if you enable address space layout randomization, which is disabled by, uh, by default. And time or program state based randomness is really the only randomness you're going to get from this source. And when it comes to the interrupt timings, the, one of the big problems is that it really puts the burden on the developer because the developer has to select which interrupts to draw the entropy from. So that means that they have to decide are these uh, quality sources, are they not triggered too periodically, et cetera, et cetera. But this doesn't really matter because in almost all QNX versions, there is no reseed control. Uh, they actually, after reversing the binary, they implemented the functions, but they never actually call them. Which means that runtime entropy is accumulated, but never actually mixed back into the state. And boot time entropy is the only entropy you'll find in the entropy pool of a QNX Yarrow implementation. And this is very dangerous, especially if we consider the quality of uh, boot time entropy we earlier saw. In the latest version, QNX 6.6, this uh, is there was an attempt to fix this by integrating some form of reseeding into functions called during initialization and output. So whenever the PRNG output, it reseeds from part of the pool. But an issue is that no entropy estimation is actually done. Be and this is what Yarrow was initially designed to do, to do entropy estimation on your entropy pools. So you only reseed when you have proper entropic quality in these pools. But this isn't what it does. It just reseeds all the time. Luckily, we disclosed some of these issues to BlackBerry. And based on our suggestions, they drafted a new Fortuna-based PRNG. Fortuna is the, the successor of, uh, of Yarrow, for those who don't know. And it's available in patches for QNX 6.6. .6, and it will be the default random number generator for uh, the upcoming QNX 7, which should be released, I think, in January or something like that. So this brings us to uh, the next operating system, which we can't mention because it was studied under NDA. Um, it's a POSIX-compliant real-time operating system used in highly sensitive systems such as the Joint Strike Fighter, the JTRS military radio system, and the International Space Station. And uh, it has a random number generator available via DevU random interface. And it has two associated functions called URandomRead, which fills a buffer uh, with n bytes from uh, its random function, and URandomWrite, which reseeds the PRNG using only the first D word from, uh, from the buffer you provided. So that, that gives you an idea of uh, the quality of this thing. Um, so we reverse engineered this as well and uh, took a look at what the underlying PRNG actually was. And it turned out to be the glibc BSD random function with custom constants. And as the documentation clearly states, this is not a secure random number generator, so I don't know why they implemented it there, but it's there. That's not the worst thing, uh, because we also discovered a local reseed attack, because the DevU random device is world writable, which means that anyone on the system can force a PRNG reseed regardless of their privileges. So a very low privileged user can simply write a seed to the random number generator and then all across the board control the PRNG output. So yeah, that's nice. That's not even the best <laughs> but even if that even if that wasn't enough, um, we also discovered a known seed attack, because if you reverse engineer the initialization routines, you see that there's no seeding at all. There's just a static 32-bit seed, which is the same across all these operating system deployments. It doesn't vary from firmware. It's just the same sequence over and over again, and there's no actual entropy in the system at all. <laughs> so an attacker who knows the PRNG seed also knows because PRNGs are deterministic functions, they also know all corresponding PRNG output consumed by crypto applications. So as you can see on the slide here, the SSH key generator simply draws from the same output we saw earlier produced by this known seed. So consider a remote attacker, no, no local attacker, who uh, has a public key generated on this target operating system, and they know the initial PRNG seed. They simply clone the random number generator, seek uh, the appropriate state offset, read from the random number generator, generate a corresponding public and private key pair, and if it matches the target public key, well, obviously also the private key matches. And if it doesn't, it iterates to the next um, state offset. And because these state offsets are determined by how many bytes have been read from the DevU random device, this is bounded by a very reasonable brute force upper bound, because I don't think more than four gigabytes will have been read from the random number generator before generating your keys. So we can even pre-compute a lot of this. 
And we can do a live demo, but this is a screenshot of an attack on the SSH day of the uh, device itself, where we recover the, uh, the private key corresponding to the uh, SSH uh, host key within a couple of tries. And uh, yeah, that's basically uh, it for uh, this operating system. You'll yeah. Uh, yeah. And the funny thing is that I don't think even they are going to patch it. But uh, so the last case study is VxWorks uh, 6.9. It's a real-time operating system initially released in 1987. It's actually using, for example, Mars Curiosity rover, Apache helicopters, or like X47B drones, or lots of telecommunication equipments. Uh, well, what VxWorks actually doesn't provide any uh, secure random number generator. And actually, you can see in libraries such as OpenSSL, WolfSSL, or Creeplip, there is no reference for it either. And uh, well, it will have predictable consequences too. So, as you can, if you search in the internet for the developers who are asking questions about this stuff, about VxWorks, you can see that, well, somebody comes and says, hey, I implemented. I use the RAND function as a seeding source for, I don't know, the OpenSSL which, as you remember, we initially said that it's not secure. It's not, it shouldn't be used uh, for security purposes. And well, yeah. Well, and if you were thinking that uh, this three operating system, or at least uh, the first two which had problem, and you were laughing a lot about it, uh, is the divorce. Actually, it's not. Actually, in the embedded OSs and real-time operating systems, actually, majority of them do not support any secure random number generator. And, uh, and VxWorks is far from the only one with these problems, but well, VxWorks is one of the biggest ones, and you expect that they provide something which they don't. Yeah. And you want to give a yeah, takeaway? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what are the takeaways from this talk? Well, the first one is that the embedded world is harsh because there are constraints everywhere, and low entropy issues are very serious, and it's, it's hard to deal with these in an operating system that seeks deployment across various kinds of chips with different capabilities. Uh, CSP or NG design is not a joke. Secure randomness should be provided as an operating system service whenever possible. Please don't put the burden on developers because they will screw up, as screw these, up, uh, exactly. these, these <laughs> issues from the, the mailing lists uh, have shown. And more scrutiny is required because the advice just use DevU random should not land the developer into trouble as it would with these previous uh, operating systems. And too much of the embedded security world is still unexplored terrain, so we need more offensive uh, research into these embedded operating systems to get them almost up to speed with the general purpose world. So if you're looking for more technical details on embedded security, I recommend our talk at Usenix Enigma in 2017. And if you've got any questions, uh, you can ask them now. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot first. Um, for questions and answers, please use the microphones. Um, just line up behind the microphones and I'll pick you for your questions. I'll start with you. Yeah, so this is not a question. This is a nice uh, story that might be replicated. Um, please, only questions at the moment would be no, really this friendly. this is about randomness. This is about randomness. Okay. <laughs> I talked to an HP lab engineer from Bristol and he told me the following story. Because they had so much bandwidth on the internet, they, they then decided, well, let's see what happens if we send a random bit stream to DEF0 in a foreign country. It just took two weeks for the G GCHQ to knock on their door and ask them what the heck they are doing there. And the random number generator they used was, was a noise diet. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from the internet. Is a radio noise from a software-defined radio a good source of entropy for a random number generator? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question there? Uh, is radio noise uh, that you get from a software-defined radio chip, would that be a good source of entropy? <laughs> I, As a known quantity. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends on your threat model, because um, 
is, is it possible that the attacker controls radio signals around the device that, that draws solemnly from the, uh, the, the RF chip? In, uh, in I mean, a specific frequency range, yes. Yeah, if, I it, mean, if we can control a specific frequency, then, well, it's not. But it's it, really dependent on the yeah, case. Yeah, it, it could be good, but it really depends on your threat model. Is it a remote attacker you're dealing with, uh, an attacker with physical access, et cetera, et cetera? Um, one of the slides you mentioned... Uh, a little bit closer to the microphone, please. In one of the slides you mentioned uh, early boot entropy, low entropy attacks. Um, do you have any best practice recommendations for application developers? Because on Linux, dev random blocks. For example, on the BSDs, dev random does not block unless it hasn't been seeded yet, and OpenBSD seeds it in the bootloader stage before the, even the kernel main function runs. So, is the, it no application developers are supposed to know every operating system? Well, the, the problem with, with the blocking thing is, and, and this came up in communications with BlackBerry as well, is that if you say, I only provide randomness. Uh, when I have sufficient entropy in the pool and I'm sure this is this is high quality This is not as easy to do in the embedded world because uh, that means that for example If you need some source of secure randomness during boot and you don't have enough entropy then boot times get really slow And especially if you have devices under real-time constraints This is an engineering hurdle uh, right there. So I, I I'd say there a paper was published I think at Security and Privacy 2013 I think it was called something like Welcome to the Anthropics or something <laughs> like that and uh, there were some good best practices recommendations for the embedded world there mainly in the form of seed files but as we mentioned already if you have diskless nodes there it's kind of an open problem to design a real a good uh, embedded open source uh, random number generator for uh, yeah all across the board Uh, second microphone back there, please. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned the NDA you have with the vendor. Um, what is the nature of your relationship with this vendor? How did you end up with an NDA with them? And <laughs> how, how do you, how are you so sure that they're not going to fix it? I'll have a comment. <laughs> 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 I, can just, I can just tell you that it took one year for us to get to us because they're providing well, they claim security, we are security, so and that's how it is, to be honest, in lots of real-time operating systems. They are living in 1998. Okay. Once, so, so it's yeah. an academic effort, not a consulting uh, assignment? Yes. Okay, thank you. Eric. Okay, then you, please. Uh, thanks for a cool talk. Uh, first question, um, ARM v8 uh, relies on uh, UEFI uh, random before uh, for initializing kernel address randomization layout randomization um, do you think that relying on bootloader is better for operating system than trying to solve random problem with ugly means i, I mean don't take in, into don't, don't take um, random number generating into the responsibility of the operating system but put it to bootloader yeah, I mean, I guess that depends on, uh, well, on, on, on your design model. For example, um, that would require you to, to uh, have a bootloader that's standardized all across the board where you want to deploy it. For example, if there's no bootloader that's suitable for the kind of embedded systems you want, but you do want an operating system and it doesn't have a random number generator, then you're left without a random number generator. So it's the, one of the biggest problems, and that's, this is where this polyculture argument comes in, is that in the general purpose world, you can make some assumptions about hardware roughly looks like this, roughly has these capabilities, software the same. But in the, embe in the embedded world, there is so much uh, diversity that it's probably better to um, optionally include functionality all across the, uh, the software stack in this case than to simply say, oh, we simply assume it's there in the bootloader and then it turns out that it's not there in the bootloader. Okay, thanks. Another idea. Um, can we rely on the manufacturer which uh, makes a small device without uh, random number sources uh, to put, um, to feed the device by random input during the manufacturing, uh, I mean, attach the device 
uh, before selling it to some random, uh, expensive random number generator, uh, get the random input and then go. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things I, I mentioned that's essentially a seed file. And it's one of the things I, I mentioned in the slides. Uh, if you include a seed file with your firmware image and you make sure it's random per firmware image, then that might be uh, a workaround. But that depends on how well the vendor understands what they're doing, because a case in point would be the Western Digital self-encrypting drives uh, thing, <laughs> where they actually generated keys based on the uh, libc rand function. So, or VX works. Yeah, that kind of stuff. So it, it could be a solution, but yeah, that depends on the vendor uh, whether they do it well. Thanks, you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one short last question. Um, Okay, you have three pretty bad examples here. Um, do you have a broader field, a broader view of the field? Are there, is it a general problem that they are all this bad or did you just pick the three worst ones that you stumbled upon? Um, are there some <laughs> operating systems that do it right and whatever um, right might be? Should I say no, actually these are the best. Got the best. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. A warm round of applause for them again, please. <laughs>